Are we live? I think we're live. I think we're live. Awesome. All right, so just test, test, test. Can everybody hear me? All right, welcome everybody. Oh, already got a comment. Uh, Coffee Acorn, there's a good chance I won't be able to be awake. Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll address that question when it comes up. Um, that's actually a good point, actually. So welcome everybody to the stream. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Uh, my computer is saying that people can hear me, so that's good. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So today's topic is actually kind of interesting topic, all right? One that I haven't really received before. Uh, but someone wants to know, how do you actually practice composing beyond the typical kind of cliche of write more music? Um, because there is a method. How do you make sure that you can basically become a better composer in the fastest, most efficient amount of time possible? And that's going to be today's topic. I'm going to teach you how I was able to study and how I was able to get to like the professional level, finding work, finding job, being able to do teach classes and such without ever finishing a music degree because of the methods that I use for practicing. Um, but before I do that, a little bit of uh, house cleaning real quick. So last week I received some feedback that if I'm going to call this a live stream lesson, I should probably do the lesson first, right? So today I'm changing things up a bit. I'm gonna focus on teaching the lesson first. All right, so instead of answering all your questions in the comments as they come in, I'm just gonna focus on the lesson, teach the lesson, and then after the lesson is done, then I'll kind of take a Q&A afterwards. I'll go through the comments and I'll address them as they come in. If you have something super important or anything, Super chats are available. I will answer super chats. I will interrupt the lesson to answer and address a super chat, but they're not necessary, all right? Put your question in the comments. I will address it. I just need to make sure that I get through this lesson first. Sound good? All right, so with that in mind, let's kind of get on to this topic of how do you actually practice, all right? So how do you become a better composer? All right, in fact, let's just start a new, well, no, I'll just leave this here. All right, so the question is basically, how do you become a better composer? How do you practice? It's one thing to practice piano, another thing to practice guitar, but how do you actually teach yourself to be a better composer? Now, in my experience, for some of you in my background, I went to grad school to be a therapist, and during grad school, I had a teaching fellowship, all right? So I was responsible for teaching a class. I loved it, and... Along the way, there's basically kind of a three-step process that you want to follow for teaching. This is the process I follow for myself. All right, so training. Step one is that you need to pick a performance-related goal, all right? This is actually kind of similar to, uh, if you have any experience working with personal trainers or strength coaches, I think this is a similar model to there. But a performance-related goal is something you actually want to do that you can't do yet. Maybe you want to write like uh, John Williams. Maybe there's a piece of music that Hans Zimmer wrote that you really like. Maybe you're like me and Daniel Pemberton's soundtrack for Across the Spider-Verse just blew you away, right? And you want to do that. You want to write something like that. Maybe your favorite cue from Across the Spider-Verse is to find a band or something like that. The ending credits thing where all the themes are coming in. It's this really cool kind of punk rock, electronic, orchestral fusion kind of thing. And you think, that's what I want to do, right? That's the kind of music I want to write, all right? But you need to start with that kind of goal. And it needs to be specific. When I say performance related, I mean it has to be something where you can say, by a certain date, you want to do this thing. You want to write a piece of music like that. So performance related goals could be something like write a symphony, uh, write a piece of music like insert favorite composer. Um, maybe you wanted to score a film, uh, write a film soundtrack, score a video game. All right, you wanna do something specific, something that you want to do, but you don't feel confident that you can do. All right, so once you have your performance-related goal, all right, let's say you wanna write, write music like uh, Nueva York, Train Chase. One of my personal favorite cues from Daniel Pemberton's score to Across the Spider-Verse. So that's my specific goal. That's what I want to be able to do that I cannot currently do. Step number two, once you've identified this step, once you've identified your performance goal, you wanna find the gap, all right? What is the gap between 
you right now and your performance goal, right? What can't you do that you need to be able to develop? So maybe for this piece, it's like you, you, you want to write that kind of music, but you don't know how to use synths. All right, let's see. It's, uh, oh, uh, yeah, so just double checking everybody can hear. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Oh, awesome. Bryce, I'm glad this is your question. Uh, it's a good one because basically we're trying to find that gap. All right? Where are you right now? Where? What do you need to do? And you want to create a list of all your skills. So maybe you can't, uh, you don't know how to use synths. Maybe you don't feel comfortable creating chord progressions. Maybe you don't know how uh, to mix music. We want to create a list of all these things that you don't know how, that these obstacles that are blocking you from achieving your performance goal, the thing you want to do, but you just can't yet because you're lacking the skills. Um, Another word for these, if you want to look at more of the kind of the educational theory kind of thing, is terminal objectives. Things that when, when you're designing a class or a curriculum, the terminal objective is basically a list of promises you have for your students. What are the things that your students will know how to do? So when I was designing my class on portraying motions well, with music, some of my terminal objectives were my students are going to know how to write emotional chord progressions. My students are going to know how to pick emotional instrumentation. My students are going to know how to manipulate the intensity of their emotions, stuff like that. So terminal objectives are like the end goal things. And then for each terminal objective, you're going to create enabling objectives. So an enabling objective, let's write this down, all right? Objectives equal end goals, right? Things you want to be able to learn or accomplish from your training. All right, then your enabling objectives are mini goals that help you achieve the terminal objectives. So for example, this one, if my terminal objective, I don't know how to use synths, all right? I need to figure out a couple of things I can do along the way that can help me with that. But before I get ahead of myself, again, I feel like I'm kind of, oh, this, is this stuff useful? All right. Let me know if people have feedback or, you know, I've got a couple, a little, just a little bit more. Then I'll take a break, make sure people are following along. So we've got step one for like learning how to become a better composer is to identify what your goals are. Basically, what is your image of a better composer? All right. So again, I recommend something specific. The more specific, the better. So a lot of people love John Williams. Maybe you are just a super nerd for Jurassic Park. So you want to be able to put together a film score like Jurassic Park. Uh, once you've got that goal, you want to write something like that, you need to find out what your gap is because the gap is what's going to be, what, what skills do you need? What skills are you currently lacking? And then the third step is to build a plan to bridge the gap. All right, so... Let's try and put together kind of like a plan for that one, actually. Let's go performance related goal. Mint's goal equals write music like John Williams's score to Jurassic Park. All right, that's your performance goal. All right, so the gap, all right, what are you missing that you can't currently do? So maybe for lots of people, you can't write, uh, can't orchestrate romantic style music. Can't write memorable melodies. Um, can't write interesting chord progressions. Let's just say that's three. All right, you could theoretically go through a big list. All right, you could say maybe you don't like, you don't feel comfortable writing for percussion or something. Um, Maybe you don't feel comfortable writing chord progressions. You come up with like an eight bar melody, but you don't know what to do with it from there. But that's basically what we're looking for here is, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm off my game today. All right, I'm sorry, it's, it's been a long day. I'm hot, I'm tired, uh, but uh, hopefully this is helpful. I'm gonna keep going. I'm not gonna doubt myself, I'm gonna keep going. So part of this app too, like I said, is figuring out the difference between your terminal objectives and your enabling objectives. So the terminal objectives, like I said, are your end goal things. You want to be able to write the romantic style music. 
You want to be able to write memorable melodies and turn them into full-length structured pieces. You want to be able to write interesting Hollywood-style chord progressions. Let's finish this romantic style. So then the enabling objectives are, like I said, mini goals. You can think of your enabling objectives as YouTube videos that you're going to Google, or maybe lessons you're going to try and find, or maybe books you're going to read. Um, Uh-oh, is th are things buffering? Are things buffering? Let's see. All right, so I'm not seeing any complaints about buffering. I apologize for that if it is. I got like the spinning thing on YouTube. Um, anywho, so for the gap, we've got our terminal objectives, right? These are your end goals. You want to write romantic style music. So the enabling objectives are many things, basically the building steps that you need to find. All right, and this is part of step three, building a plan to bridge the gap. So you wanna look at each of your term terminal objectives. So what are you missing? Why can't you write romantic style music? All right, so this takes a bit of time. It takes some honesty. Maybe you think you don't know how to write for brass. You don't feel comfortable with percussion. You don't know how to use different layers in your music. Uh, maybe you don't know how to pick which instruments you want to use. But you basically, you wanna go through a list and come up with a list of all the questions you have, things that you feel confused about, things that you feel like are missing in your education. You've got this idea of you wanna write music like John Williams score to Jurassic Park, but you don't think you can orchestrate like him. You don't think you can write melodies like him. You can't write chord progressions for him. Figure out why, why can't you orchestrate like him? What knowledge are you missing, all right? You don't know how to write for brass. You don't know about percussion. You don't know different layers of your music. You don't know how to make instruments you wanna use. Maybe you don't know how to use sound libraries, how to make realistic sounds with sound libraries. You wanna create a list of every possible little thing that you think you're missing because you're gonna start tackling these one at a time. All right, so let's say for writing memorable melodies. Maybe you feel comfortable writing an idea, but you don't know how to get past eight bars. You can't get past eight bars, all right? Maybe you don't know how to create, uh-oh. It says it's getting buffering. All right. It says YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will experience buffering. All right, is anybody having issues? No? All right. I'm not seeing any comments. All right. I apologize if it's buffering. I'm not sure how to fix that. It says open widget. No, it just says that there's issues. Um, If it gets bad, let me know. I'll go through and I'll... Maybe we can exit out and restart the stream. I don't know. We'll see. Um, In the meantime, I'm just going to keep going. Okay so, okay, so Jack says it's a little choppy, but you can hear what I'm saying. All right, yeah, definitely some buffering. I apologize, I have no idea how to control for that. I've got good. Okay, so good. So yeah, so Cam says it's a little bit, but it's not hard as good, thank you. I don't know, I've got good internet. No idea why it's, I'm the only one home right now too. So anywho, not an issue. If people can tolerate it, we'll keep going. All right, so issues with melody writing. Maybe you said you can't get past eight bars. Maybe you don't know, uh, come up with uh, uh, contrasting themes. Uh, maybe you feel uncomfortable writing uh, counter melodies or counterpoint. Maybe you're basically just listening and figure out what are the things that you're missing? What are your points where you feel like you're lacking, that you're missing out on, or that you just that keeps you from being this John Williams level composer that you want? And really focus on skills. All right, so when I've done this process with students in the past, a lot of them will start to bring up stuff like, oh, well, I don't have the money. For this I don't have the money to hire an orchestra or I can't write like John Williams because I can't afford a tuition at Juilliard it's like all right yeah awesome that's that's a bummer that kind of sucks I wish we all had the money to go to Juilliard that would be nice but that's not something that you can control right now right and the focus right now is becoming a better composer sitting back and th complaining or like being sad about the things that you can't do that's not going to help you get better I mean, yeah, I get bummed that I never got to finish music school. All right, that's a big like thing. Like there, cer certainly there are days where I'm like, oh man, I wish I could have finished or gotten a degree or something. But that doesn't help me move forward. You know, I said what does 
is studying. What does is working on the jobs I have. What does is networking. What does help is studying and writing and doing live streams like this and connecting with really cool people. So you want to focus on things that are actionable. All right. So yeah, for orchestration, maybe, yeah. One of the reasons why you can't write like John Williams is you can't afford a Juilliard education or you can't uh, afford to hire an entire orchestra to play your stuff. True. That's some issue, but you want to focus on the things that you actually have control over, things that you can act on. So for example, you can't know, you don't know chord progressions. Maybe you don't know music theory. All right. Maybe you just don't know how to use cadences. How to, or get out of a key. Maybe you don't know how to use just like advanced chord, or like jazz chords or anything. You want to make a list of all the things that you feel are blocking you. Things that are obstacles. Things that are, like my my abuelito always used to say that there are, there are like, uh, there's a bridge in life. And sometimes you got to cross a bridge and there's someone on the other side who doesn't want to let you through. So all you can do is lower your head and charge right at them. All right, so who are your little trolls? Who are the people stopping you from across that bridge? Is it your inability to read music? Is your inability to understand what instruments are in the percussion section or how to use percussion? Is it your inability to know the ranges of different woodwinds? You wanna come up with a list of every little thing because step three is to create a plan. All right, so personally, the way I like to do this is I like to tackle one terminal objective at a time. Remember the terminal objectives are the big ones. All right. We decided what your goal is, a specific goal. You want to write X style of music or you want to score a video game. Sometimes maybe you're like, you don't know how to use the technology to score a video game. You don't know how to make interactive music. Maybe you don't know how to use a DAW, something basic like that. You want to come up with a list with everything that's blocking you from your goal, your performance related goal, something you want to do but currently lack the skill or ability to accomplish. Then you wanna create a list of all the different things that are stopping you, your terminal objectives, the big skills, big picture. For example, John Williams, Jurassic Park, can't write romantic style music, you don't know how to orchestrate. Uh, you can't write memorable melodies, you get stuck after every eight bars or so. You can't write interesting chord progressions. Create a list of the big picture stuff. And then after you've done that, these are your terminal objectives. Remember, come up with a list of your enabling objectives. What specifically stops you from this? What specifically stops you from orchestrating romantic style music? Like I said, maybe you don't know how to write for brass. Maybe you're not comfortable with percussion. All these little things. I'm repeating myself at this point. But what I will do is I will, once every several months, put together a new performance goal. So maybe it was, so one of them that was recent was like, I wanted to write music like Daniel Pemberton's soundtrack for Across the Spider-Verse. My, one of my biggest goals was I have no idea what I'm doing with synthesizers. So a lot of it was I have access to synthesizers. I just don't know how to use them. I don't know a workflow. I don't know what kind of synths that I wanted to use. I didn't know how to create a synth other than presets. I didn't know what different effects did to synths. And so I created a list of things I didn't know. And I started working on tackling one at a time. So for example, if I were to say something like this first goal, can orchestrate romantic style music, my plan would be start with start with tackling uh, one terminal objective at a time. All right, so like I said, orchestration. Maybe I say, I don't know how to write for the brass section. So for a week or so, that's my main focus. I'm getting on YouTube. I'm asking questions like, what do I need to know about the brass section? If you want, you can go deeper, all right? What instruments are in the brass section? What roles do each instrument play? Basically, just come up with a bunch of questions. Things you want to know. Things that make you curious, that you want to master. Make a list of the things you want to learn, and then just start studying them. All right, create an action plan. Every day I spend a bare minimum of 30 minutes studying something new. Bare minimum. I've got flashcards on my phone that I go through. I've got books on my back, a bookshelf behind me that I study. I've got videos and YouTubers that I like to go to. I've got all kinds of things where I'm constantly trying to learn at least 30 minutes of something. Right now, I can tell you what my terminal objective is. All right, right now I've been hired to write a soundtrack for another project that is going to involve me composing a requiem. 
All right, I've done videos on how to do Requiem style pieces, how to re get that vibe across. But this is actually a true blue Requiem. All right, I've got prayers, I've got lyrics, I've got stuff I need to set to music. I don't have a lot of experience putting words to music. I've done songs. I started off really wanting to be a musical writer, not a film composer. Uh, so I've got some experience with lyrics, but nothing in the style of a Requiem. So right now I'm pouring through textbooks every day on setting music to, uh, setting lyrics to music. And so I'm learning how to read poetry. I'm learning how to look for meter, how to find rhythm in poetry. I'm learning how to find out what shape the music needs to have. I'm doing everything I can to try to meet that end goal, that terminal objective of writing music for lyrics, all right? Putting choral music to lyrics. So not just like songs and stuff, but a choral performance, an orchestral kind of performance. And so my terminal objectives are things like, I wanna learn how to read poetry to find the right meter. I wanna learn how to study and break down text to figure out how to inform the music. I wanna learn how instruments are layered with voices and how that's orchestrated for live performance and stuff like that. So I've got a whole list of things I'm doing and I'm just trying to tick off each question one at a time. Now, the whole point of this, the whole point of taking the time to map out your kind of studying, your training to be a composer, is to give yourself an actual map, an actionable item. The best musicians always have a plan for how they're going to practice. So back when I was a trumpet player, I had, um, I mean, I still like to think of myself as a trumpet player. I just haven't played in a long time. But back when I was a, like a practicing trumpet player, I had my practice sessions broken down to the minute. All right, so I had a model for if I had 30 minutes to practice, I had a model for 45, an hour, and two hours. I had exactly how to divide up the time doing what. There was uh, warm-ups involved, there was lip slurs involved, there was uh, uh, technique practice, there was music practice for performance, there was improv uh, like improvisation, and that wasn't designed by me. It was designed by my tutor, by my, not my professor, she was a grad student, but the person in charge of helping me practice trumpet. And there's this structure in place because the goal of practice is to get better. And you cannot just get better by accident. Well, you can, but it's a much, much slower process. If you have a clear idea of what it means to be better, of where you want to be but aren't so far, and you build a plan for how to get there, you're gonna get there much faster than just meandering, playing around pieces, making new music, doing stuff like that. Um, is any of this making sense? Basically, long story short, have a plan, and this is how you make the plan, all right? So I'm going to summarize this real quick, because I've been rambling for like, what, 22 minutes now, and I have no idea how coherent this has been, because I haven't been paying attention to the comments. But, uh, so let's kind of go through each of them again, all right? Training, if you want to be better at a composer and you want it to be exponential, this is going to be exponential, I promise, for so many of you, especially if you are new to your journey, all right? Pick a performance-related goal. What, it, no, no, sorry, YouTube sent me a message saying they were gonna run an ad, I have to stop that. Um, okay, so. It says pick a performance related goal, all right? What is something specific that you want to do, but you can't? So sometimes that could be something just like you can't, you wanna write a certain orchestral style. Sometimes it's a very specific sample of a specific composer you like. Sometimes it's a specific genre of music you like. Maybe you're a classical musician, but you also got inspired by Daniel Pemberton's score to Across the Spider-Verse. So now you wanna learn more about hip hop. So that's your goal. You want to learn how to write a piece of music in the genre of hip hop. Whatever it is, pick your performance related goal, something you want to do, a skill you want to have that you do not currently have. Next, be very detailed on the gap between who you are now, your current skill level, and what you want to obtain. What's missing? Why aren't you here? What skills are lacking? What obstacles exist? What's in your way? What do you have to get past to reach that ideal new level that you're looking for? And the third, third step seems pretty simple. It can be as complicated as you want, but you need to build a plan. All right, how are you gonna tackle it? Are you going to tackle these one at a time? Are you gonna do a little bit of each for uh, for a little bit like at the, every day? So when I first started, I broke mine into three specific goals. I wanted to get better at writing melodies. I wanted to get better at writing chord progressions and I wanted to get better at orchestration. And so every single day, I spent a little bit of practice on each of those three. Since then, I've decided like my style, since I've, I feel like I'm at a nice 
baseline of skill set that I still want to keep improving, but I've got work that I need to do now. I'll just tackle one at a time. I'll tackle one at a time. I'll take down each of my enabling objectives, those little mini goals that help me reach my performance goal. And then once I feel like I've got that, I move on to the next one. I have friends who will map out entire months ahead of themselves. I'm not that crazy. I'll basically just put together one plan. I won't have a specific timeline, but you can do a timeline. Some of the most talented musicians I have ever met had specific timelines, uh, oftentimes correlating to a concert they had to perform. They're like, all right, they've got a concert they have to give. Maybe it was a thesis or something for their degree. Like, I need to do this performance. There's this piece I need to play. What am I lacking? What technical skills am I lacking? What, of how many hours of practice am I missing? What kind of expression do I need for the performance? But they would have a very like detailed practice record that they had planned out for months so that they would peak right on the day of their performance and they would know that it was time to do that piano recital or whatever they were doing, they would be ready for it. That's the same kind of mentality that you can take as a composer. All right, so hopefully, hopefully that was all helpful. Um, now the lesson is done, so I can start doing the Q&A now. I'm going to minimize this because I don't want to exit on anything, just in case. All right, let's go through some questions, shall we? All right, so Coffee Acorn 1346. There's a good chance I won't be awake when this starts. Could you answer for me how you get over writer's block and force out a piece when you have no inspiration or are unable to develop a short phrase? Yes, and wonderful uh, question. So this is kind of a pushback I get a lot on YouTube is lots of people will leave comments saying, well, this feels like you're over intellectualizing music. And at times I am. Yes, it's important to trust your instinct, to trust that motivation and inspiration as it comes. But the fact of the matter is if you want to be a professional, you have timelines that you need to meet. You have deadlines where a soundtrack is due. You have moments where rough drafts are needed. Whatever it is, you have deadlines and you can't wait or rely on inspiration. A director won't hire you again if you have a reputation of being the guy who's like, oh yeah, I am I know it was supposed to be due two weeks ago, but uh, I just haven't felt inspired for it. No, so the tricky part is how do you get past writer's block? And that whole kind of ramble was basically, you have to intellectualize it. So my best strategy and I've shared this with a lot of my students, when you feel stuck, when you feel like there's no inspiration, you have no kind of motivation to do this, there's no ideas that are coming, your best weapon is to treat it like homework. All right, do something that you know on an intellectual level works. All right, so even if it's not a wonderful melody, you know, all right, it's got proper phrase structure. All right, it's eight bars. I followed sentence structure. It builds towards the local peak. It comes back down for the cadence. My chord progression fits because it's got a pattern. I've got a baseline that supports it. Just treat it like a homework assignment. Do something that works on an intellectual level. Something that if you had a professor or a tutor or someone who had said, write me an eight bar melody, you could say, yeah, here's an eight bar melody. I did it. You might not love it, but it works. So if you're stuck with if you're stuck with writer's block, here I will do is I will set a number. I will say, all right, I'm not feeling it today. I know that I need a theme for this character. I'm going to give myself one hour. I'm going to write five themes. I don't care if I love them. I just know that they work on an intellectual level. All right. I know that it'll function. All right. I'm going to write those five themes, sometimes more. I will be done. I'll get up and I'll walk away. Sometimes I walk away for the full day. Sometimes I just go out and go for a walk. Sometimes I play some video games or watch a TV show, call my mom, do something that's not music, all right, to help kind of reset, refresh. And then the next time I sit down, I'm going to listen to my intellectually uh, over-intellectualized melodies. Because the crazy thing is that if a melody works on an intellectual level, then it's going to work. It's got something. And chances are, even if I wasn't feeling too crazy about those five ideas, when I come back to it maybe an hour later, or even a whole day later, I'm gonna feel more fresh and at least one of those ideas is gonna stick out to me. I'll have at least one idea where I'm like, all right, all right, there's something there. There's something there. I can play around with this. And sometimes it's great. I'm like, oh, no, awesome, this is awesome. I love this. I can't believe I didn't like this before. And I'll jump with it. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I've got some inspiration. I've got some ideas, but it'll kickstart some revisions. And through those revisions, I build some momentum. Um, so basically the whole idea behind this is if you are not feeling inspired, you just have to find a way to force yourself to keep going. Like I said, treat it like a homework assignment, do something. And then when you come back later after a break, 
having a having somewhere to start with something to work with almost always gets you moving all right it helps kickstart some kind of creativity i have never failed to at least get some kind of momentum going by using this strategy there have been so many times where i've just been stuck coming up with something um sometimes it's not even overly intellectual a lot of the time i will retreat to that a lot of time if i'm stuck with a melody i'm like all right I need a melody for this character. I've been working on it for days. I can't come up with anything. I'm going to come up with eight ideas. So I come up with eight chord progressions. Then on top of each chord progression, I write a melody. All right. And I use all of them using step-by-step -step process that you can learn in my playlists, harmony for composer and melody for composer, where, like I said, I treat it like an intellectual academic exercise. I have never failed to walk away with at least one idea that ended up becoming a theme or one idea that inspired a theme. Um, it's just about trying to get something because the worst thing you can do with writer's block is just sit there and produce nothing So when in doubt, like I said, treat it like an academic exercise write something Sometimes I'll do it like that. Sometimes I just sing All right I have been guilty of just sitting up a mic watching a scene and just improvising as I sing on top of it Just like scatting around do ba 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 Just doing something creating something weird. I feel stupid. I feel self-conscious. It's fine I record something then I mute it I do it again, I come up with something else. I mute that, I come up with something else. And even when I do that, I always at least get a motif. I always at least get a tiny little idea, a grain of an idea that inspires something else. It's all about trying to get that kick started. Uh, so hopefully that helps Coffee Acorn 1346. All right, uh, Tamashi, welcome. Ab Down, welcome. Bryce, awesome, that was your question, I'm glad. Um, Menker, welcome. Jack, welcome. Matt, hello. Um, Bryce, yeah, breaking down the much broader questions is really helpful. I'm assuming this is for the lesson earlier. I'm glad. Uh, Jack, yeah, it makes sense. Practice isn't as useful if you don't have a specific goal of what you want to practice. Very, very true. So I have such an eclectic background, guys. I have had so many different jobs. Um, I've worked in a factory. I've been uh, an instructor. I've been a researcher. Uh, one of my favorite things I ever did was I worked as a strength coach. I'm a huge strength sports nerd, especially the sport of strongman. I really love the sport of strongman. I follow, I'm a huge nerd with that stuff. But for several years, I worked as a strength coach. And when you're kind of going training, you're getting certified and all that stuff, one of the biggest lessons I found was the difference between exercise and training. All right, exercise is just done for its own sake. All right, you go to the gym and you get your exercise in because exercise is healthy for you. You checked it off the list. Training is done for a very specific goal in the future. Like you go to the gym and you deadlift 430 pounds for three sets of six reps because you are building your way up towards a heavy single where you want to hit 600 pounds or whatever your goal is. That workout is a very specific step, very important step to get you towards your goal. You're not just going to that workout because you want to get exercise in for the day. You are going to that workout because that workout's going to lead into this one, which leads into this one, which leads into this one, and boom, eventually you find your way at your goal. And that's really what you want to treat. You want to treat your exercise, your practice as training, not just exercise. You don't want to just practice composing because, oh, I'm supposed to practice every day. No, you want to practice because you have a very specific goal in mind, and this gets you closer to it. And the key point is to know how it gets you closer. Like I said, breaking it down to that process is supremely helpful, at least for me. Um, let's see, Menker Oriental, message retracted. Um, okay, so then here we go. Here we're getting to the part where it was buffering. Uh, VTubers, now the composers. Uh, sign out, sounds good to me. Okay, awesome. Bryce, very cool here. Okay, awesome. So these are just four HS, message retracted again. A couple of retracted messages. Um, Sly Nell, how to deal with imposter syndrome. Oh, that's a tough one. All right, imposter syndrome is awful. All right, and a lot of you probably know what imposter syndrome is, even if you haven't experienced, if you don't know the name for it. Uh, but imposter syndrome is this pervasive belief that everyone around you belongs here, but you don't. I have experienced that so much. Many people have experienced that over there. When I first went to school, I made it into a, uh, I, got, I made it into the best school in my state, in the United States. I got into the best public school that my state has to offer. And I felt like an incredible imposter for a number of reasons. One, I had a uh, academic advisor in high school who was just a jerk and told me not to apply because they would never even, they would never even consider me. Um, 
I was in a relationship at the time that didn't give me a lot of self, uh, that didn't give me a very high opinion of myself academically. There was a whole bunch of kind of reasons going into it, but I did not feel like I belonged. I felt like I was drowning and everyone else had earned their spot in there and somehow I just kind of slipped in by accident. Um, and sometimes it feels the same with music. Very often it feels like the same place with music. You're surrounded by people who went to school for this. I'm surrounded by people who have degrees. I am surrounded by people who can play instruments at levels that I could never, or that I have never and probably will never reach. And you always feel like other people have earned their spot. Now, the tricky part is figuring out how to deal with it. And every single person has a different approach and some people never get past it. And all I can do is share the kind of the thing that tipped the scales for me. All right. So I never really got past my imposter syndrome in school. I never got past this idea that everyone else had earned their spot and somehow I didn't. But I did flip a switch where I stopped caring. And there was just this narrative that I told myself that it doesn't matter whether I belong or not. It doesn't matter if everyone else is supposed to be here and I'm not. The only thing that matters is I am here. This is what I'm doing. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to take advantage of it. All right, so every opportunity I could find, I sought it out. Not because I felt like I earned it or that I could get it, but because I thought, I'm here. That's what I'm going to do. If I'm here, I'm going to use it to the best of my ability until I get kicked out or whatever happens. And for music, it was very much the same. I thought, you know what? I don't belong here. Maybe I don't have the credentials other people do, but I'm here. All right, and this is what I'm doing. It's what I love to do. I don't care if things don't work out. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to push forward. I don't care if I'm an imposter. I'm just going to do it. All right. So again, I don't know if that can help. Everyone is different. I've heard people who say like silence the critic or just know that you're loved, all this kind of stuff. None of that ever really worked for me. All that worked for me was like, all right, I'm going to be a bit greedy. Maybe I don't belong. I don't know if I do or not. I don't care. I am here and I am going to take it for everything that I can. All right. But I've always kind of been a bit of more of like, my sister calls me a Slytherin, all right? I'm gonna take what I can get. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm an ambitious person, all right? And so I'm not gonna worry about whether or not, I don't know. I don't wanna make myself sound like a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I don't think I am. And I'm not this crazy kind of evil Slytherin. I'm not I'm not a Death Eater. Er, <laughs> all right, metaphor's going too far. Um, but no, yeah. So basically, all I'm saying is that's what worked for me, is realizing I don't care if I'm an imposter or not, I'm here. All right, that is the fact of the matter. I am here. It doesn't matter whether I think I deserve to be here. I am here, so I'm gonna take it for what I got. Hopefully, that's helpful for you. But uh, if you, if it does get bad, if you do struggle a lot with imposter syndrome, I cannot recommend enough. A th find a therapist. Find someone to talk to. A lot of you know that I, my background, my education was to be in therapy. I am a big believer in therapy. I believe everyone should go to therapy the same way that everyone should go see a dentist and everyone should go to a doctor. You got to take care of yourself, all right? So that's kind of my getting off my soapbox. Let's see here. So Matt Lewis, I hate uh, is, uh, I hate is TTA. Um, I don't know what I hate is TTA, but I know, oh, what is TTA? I was thought that's what you're asking. So if you follow me on Instagram or even on YouTube, I made, let me find it. I made this post, all right? And yeah, you guys are on the streams, so I'll tell you what it is. Because I mentioned that you'll find it on the channel, uh, on streams. All right, so I made this post. Coming soon, December 20th. All right, Tabletop Academy is what this is. It is a dream I've been working on for a long time. Cheesy name, I know. Maybe I'll change it, but for now, it's that's the name. That's the logo. Uh, it's a free music school. All right, so right now, I have four classes that I have made. Uh, there right now it's low budget. So it's just videos taken from YouTube. I have basically I've got 250 videos on my YouTube channel some more than 250 videos and so I've put together four classes Structured by saying all right, you want to for example, I have a class on harmony and chord progressions Do you want to know how to write music use music theory to write really cool really emotional really awesome chord progressions? If you do here are all the videos I would recommend you watch. Here's the order you would watch them in here are notes that I'm providing for each of these videos, along with homework assignments you can do to practice what's in these videos, and a community on Discord where you can connect, share your homework, and kind of compare lessons and ideas with other musicians who are also doing that. 
So right now I have four classes that I'm going to be doing. I'm making a landing page. I got to build the Discord channel and all that. But I have a class on chord progressions and harmony and music theory and how that helps. I have a class on melody writing. And I have two classes on orchestration. One on instrumentation and just kind of knowing all the instruments in the orchestra and what they can do. And then one on actually applying all of it to arrange music the way you want to. All right, like I said, all of these based off videos from my YouTube channel. I have multiple phases that I would like to do for this school because I do have a chip on my shoulder when it comes to music education. Like I said earlier, I had to drop out of music school because I just couldn't afford it. No one could. It was 10 grand a month. All right, couldn't do that. Um... And I mean, that's a source of great regret in my life, as anyone would have regret with big things like that. I mean, I can't help it every once in a while wondering, like, all right, where would I be in my career if I actually had that degree? But I don't. That's neither here nor there. I keep moving forward. I'm happy with the career I built for myself. I'm happy with the trajectory it has. I love doing streams like this with you people. Life is good. But part of that Slytherin attitude, I'm always going to have a chip on my shoulder that I got forced out because I was too poor. To afford an education so one of my big goals is i've always wanted to create a really nice school that's free of charge where people can learn have a quality structured education and not have to pay for it not be refused entry because they don't come from a wealthy family or a wealthy background or they don't have a bunch of loans to help push them through um so yeah that's what tta is like I said, it's starting small, just four classes. I have multiple phases of enrollments that I want to do. I have multiple more classes I want to do. I eventually want to be able to afford to put together a new curriculum, whole new lessons, new articles, all that kind of stuff. I want to do, like I said, more classes. I want to do classes on mixing. I want to do classes on synths, film scoring, um, music notation, um, all kinds of cool stuff. But I don't want to wait until I feel like I'm good enough or have the resources enough to do the whole thing. So I'm just starting with a bare minimum product. And for me, the bare minimum product, four classes, a Discord channel, and just cool homework assignments for people to work with. So that's what that is. It's coming December 20th. So keep your eyes out for that. I'll keep an, uh, like I said, 100% free enrollment. You can take the classes. I'm going to have a recommended order. You can take them in. There will be a place where people can donate if they want to help support the development of new classes. But that's all coming. All right, that's we've got a couple days still. We've got, what, 12 days left before that happens? So, yes, awesome. Uh, 4HS, hi, I have a big question. I've been trying to make memorable melodies for the past four months, and I'm just not getting anywhere. Can you please tell me tips or some help for memorable melodies? Thanks. Um, Sure. So, first off, the biggest tip I can offer you is watch my playlist. All right, I have a playlist titled Melody for Composers, right here. Melody for Composers, it's several videos. <laughs> Naruti, what is that? I uh, don't know, uh, I must have made that years ago. But yeah, so yeah, I've got a playlist, Melody for Composers. All right, check it out, it's structured like a class. In fact, that's the ba that's the basics of one of my, mel my class on Melody for the Tabletop Academy. It's all of those videos plus several others that I think are complimentary. Things like my video on writing Asanati, my video on counterpoint, uh, videos on different melodic structures, stuff like that. Um, and so I'd say start with that. The second one, I would say if you want to, if, if you just want some tips, two things that I can say right off the bat will make your melodies much, much more memorable is as you write it, sing it. All right. If you cannot sing your melody, it's probably not going to be memorable. All right. There's that. There's a music theory kind of tip that if you start studying like melody writing, you'll often find the rule that no melody should span larger than an octave, or as far as they can go, an octave plus a perfect fifth. All right. There's this rule that you don't want your melody to span too much space. Now the reason behind that is because a melody that spans way too far in range is not singable to the average person. If you want your mem your melody to be memorable, it has to be hummed. It has to be sung. It has to be caught in someone's head. All right? John Williams' music is so memorable because people leave the movie theater and they can sing it. You can sing the Star Wars thing. You can sing Duel of Fates. You can sing Jurassic Park. You can whistle it. You can hum it. You can just kind of vocalize it however you want. But human beings can perform it. That is huge for memorability. So as you're writing a melody, sing through it. Can you sing it easily? If you're struggling to sing it or it doesn't feel right or feels clunky as you're singing it, you're going to need to fix it. Take note on where it feels clunky, 
Why doesn't it feel smooth? What notes are you struggling to hit? Whatever it is, take notes and try to make it more singable. Number two, as a more kind of music theory approach, uh, get used to sentence structure, period structure, and sequencing structure. I've talked about each of those structures multiple times in live streams and lessons before, and I will have videos and information on them in my melody class coming out in 12 days. Uh, again, free of charge. Uh, but that is all going to be uh, those three, period, sentence, and sequencing structure. Those make up like 9.9 .9 out of every 10 melodies you hear. Not because there's some hidden rule that everybody needs to follow, but just because that's how human beings in Western European cultures hear music. All right, the same way that I'm speaking to you in English, if I were to start chopping up the order of my words and start talking like Yoda, you would notice that sticks out. Yoda doesn't talk like a natural born English speaking person. All right, he has this stunted weird order that he goes in. We, you don't need to understand grammar. You don't need to know the rules about how specifically you're speaking just because this is how we speak. You grew up, if you're a native English speaker or a native speaker of any language, you learn that language by hearing people. And so you get the natural cadence of it. It's very much the same for music. Music has natural cadences. The music theory isn't meant to say rules of what you have to do. Music theory is meant to describe the natural occurrences and cadences that appear within different genres of music. And so sentence structure, period structure and sequencing structure tend to be three of the most common structures and natural cadences that music follows, the most natural shapes that music will follow. So again, if I had three tips, one, make it, make it singable, sing through it, make sure it's smooth as you sing it. Two, really focus on learning those three uh, phrase shapes, sentence, structure, period, structure, and sequencing structure. Uh, learn those, and then of course, my kind of like training methodology, watch my playlist. It's structured like a class. It'll take you step A, starting with good motifs, all the way to step Z, creating full length pieces out of different melodies. All right, excellent. Where am I, where am I? Um, my word, there are so many. Um, let's see from here. Um, Okay, so that was the big question. Okay, so that was Matt asking about TTA. Bryce, when planning out your new compositional focus, do you think it's more important to make a short piece, maybe finished for each technique you learn, or make a larger piece step-by-step -step as you learn? Both. So you want to treat it, again, almost like a class that you would take in school. So we're talking about, like, if you wanted to learn about orchestration as your terminal objective. You want to write a piece of music like John Williams's theme to Jurassic Park. And one of your big things was you don't know how to write for romantic era music, uh, orchestral music. You don't know how to arrange like that. So one of the things you study is how to write for brass instruments. You just never studied the brass section. You didn't know about their strengths, their limitations, the challenges of balancing them with the other sections. So you learn that. As you do that, write a short piece. Eight bars does not need to be difficult. In fact, most of the homework assignments in the classes I've been building, each assignment is just like an eight bar melody, right? Multiple eight bar melodies. And then if you think about it, the way that most classes are structured, you've got lots of short assignments, write an eight bar melody here, write a 16 bar piece there, come up with short little ideas. But at the end of the class, there's a t final term project, all right, where you're scoring an entire short film or you're writing a full length piece of music. So start with the small assignments to practice each little idea you have. And then once you're feeling a little more comfortable, challenge yourself to build those full length pieces. Take on a big project, a portfolio builder is what I like to call them. Something you can show off at the end. Uh, and yeah, so use both. That's my recommendation. All right, so Matt, <laughs> darn article correct. Yes, Cam, well, I love scatting over scene. That's so brilliant for association. Exactly, scatting over scene, singing over scene is my go-to strategy for two things, all right? one. If I am completely at wit's end, I have no idea what how to get something to work for a character or a scene, I will play the scene and I will just sing on top of it five times and just find something. I actually did that for a final assignment once in school. We were supposed to film, we were supposed to score this scene from a film. I had procrastinated, as you do. Um... <laughs> I was behind, I didn't know what to do, I was panicking, so I sang on top of the scene, and then I just tried to mimic it with piano. And I got a passing grade, it was good. Not my best grade, but it was a passing grade. Reason number two that I will use it for is epic percussion. I will write epic music and percussion's my weak point. 
So I will write the big brass arrangements, the string parts, choirs, whatever I'm adding in there. Then my last step is I will sing a percussion part underneath it. So I'll start with three things. I'll start with the hits. So the big kind of boom. I'll just go through and I'll just sing into the microphone going boom. Boom. Just any time where I feel like there needs to be a big hit, I'll say boom or something like that. Then I'll go through and I'll add my big heavy jumps for that. Next, I'll go through and I'll just start improvising. I'll like, whatever it is. That was nonsense. But I'll come up with something, all right? And then I'll try to imitate that. Because for me, percussion, like I said, is the group, the section that I feel least comfortable with. I'm comfortable with it, just least comfortable compared to the others. So sometimes I'll just try to go with what feels natural and what goes, which you should always do. You should always go with what feels natural. I should. I don't want to seem like I over-intellectualize everything. But a lot of the times that's what, just what I'll do, uh, is I'll just improvise the percussion parts. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, yes, Menker, great advice, thanks a lot. Got any tips for switching from a band or rock metal mindset to a composer's mindset? All right, so they're both very similar. I'm going to assume if you are trying to go to a composer, like a film composer or a video game composer, the biggest switch in mindset, in my opinion, because I don't have a lot of experience in band. I did a couple bands in the past. I don't have a lot of experience. But the biggest difference is a film composer needs to be a storyteller first. All right, you are not hired to write, to improvise music on top of a scene just to hit the emotions. All right, that's important, but that's not, you're not just there to improvise on top. Uh, that's why a lot of famous songwriters, I believe Paul Simon was one of them, tried to do musicals or tried to do film scores that just didn't pan out. Some do, others don't. And the ones who don't fail because they don't realize that they need to tell a story with their music. So I'd say the biggest thing you need to focus on as you're kind of straddling those changes in uh, mentalities is one, focus on hitting the emotion of each scene. That's a given. But number two, you need to come up with a strategy for how are you telling this story? What themes do you need to tell this story? What uh, literary ideas, like what morals of the story are important to capture with the music? What characters are important to capture with the music? That's gonna be the biggest shift, is you need to start thinking about how to think like a storyteller. Um, one of my favorite YouTube channels for learning that is a YouTube channel called Hello Future Me. He's got a lot of cool like world building videos, how to do certain character kind of videos. He's a writer and he teaches people how to write uh, stories and stuff. So he's really cool to kind of give you an idea of start thinking from a story lens. And then another good book is The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. Both great resources, but I would say just that's the biggest shift. The genre is not important. We're seeing every day multiple new genres are coming into films. You don't have to be a romantic era composer to write film music. You Lots of hip hop and uh, uh, even electronic music uh, genres have found their way into film scores quite successfully. Um, and the big thing is just knowing how to use your genre to tell a story. So that's that's my... Uh, oh, thank you. Someone's giving me likes. I appreciate that. Uh, that's cool. I never noticed that I could see that. Thank you. All right, so let's see here. Um, Jack, a way to deal with imposter syndrome that kind of worked with me was I'm here because the people who hired to promote me believe me I am supposed to be here. So if they believe that, I should try as well. That's awesome. Great advice, Jack. And that really is good advice. All right, if you have a job, it's because someone thought you were a good idea. All right, someone along the line thought, yeah, let's do this, let's hire this person, this is a good idea. But even if you don't have a job, all right, uh, even if you're not working as a professional, even if you're just doing something as like a hobbyist and you just want to share your music on YouTube, there's a lot of bad stuff on YouTube, all right? That's just being honest. So even if, worst case scenario, even if your stuff is bad, it's not going to be out of place, all right? There's more than enough bad stuff on YouTube to make you feel like part of a crowd, all right? Be lost in the crowd. So I don't know if that's inspirational or kind of hurtful or I don't know what it was. Uh, but yes, Jack, that was much better than what I had to say or had to add. But yes, wonderful. All right, B. Smith. I went to school for music, but the school did not teach me anything about making good music. Can you talk about phrasing? All right, um, yeah, I can talk about phrasing. Uh, oh, so you say, for example, they taught us chordal harmony and counterpoint, but never how to apply them to writing. Going to music school was one of, if not the worst thing that ever happened to me. Ooh, I have, for different reasons, I have a similar kind of belief that like getting accepted into music school was one of the best and worst things to happen to me. Um, um, for phrasing, so yeah, so you know, so they taught you theory, but not how to apply it. 
Um, I'd be happy to talk about phrasing. It depends on what you want to learn. Do you want to learn about how to phrase a melody? Do you want to learn how to build larger pieces out of individual phrases? Once again, out of all of those things, I am going to mention, where is this? Um, I should just keep this up because I feel like I'm recommending my own content quite a bit, but I've been doing this for years, people. I've got lots of playlists. Um, let's see here. Uh, where is it? But yeah, I have my, okay, advanced orchestration techniques. That's a good one. Uh, film scoring 101, listener and leaning by listening, harmony for composers, Ghibli music, and else where is it? Uh, the Naruti. I don't know what that is. Is that like a music playlist or something? Uh, melody for composers. This playlist. Let's see what's in it. All right. Um, this is what I'm going to recommend. How to write. Uh, this will break down everything. Okay. How do I make this bigger? Um, how to write stronger motif. Developing your motifs. Phrase structure. Turning melodic ideas into full pieces turning chords into a melody, and turning chord relationships, or CRs, also known as Neo-Romanian theory, into melodies. Um, I'm going to not exit out of that, because I feel like I'm advertising my own playlist a lot. That's where I would recommend starting. Um, if you want me to spend a live stream talking about this stuff, um, recommend it as one of my, uh, on one of my posts when I ask what people want me to teach. This time, the winning choice was how to basically how to practice. And that's what the lesson was about. A close runner up was how to do jazz, like spy movie jazz music. Cause I've done that before. That was actually kind of, kind of trippy. Cause I had literally just recently taught multiple lessons to a student who had, uh, pay, who had signed up for private lessons and wanted to learn how to write big band jazz in the style of like the Incredibles and James Bond and stuff like that. So I had spent several lessons teaching someone to do that and having a lesson plans drawn up for that when someone asked me to do that for this. And I almost did, but I didn't have enough time to prep for the lesson today. So I decided to do the how to practice and get better at composing topic, but yeah, instead. So hopefully that helped. Um, let's see. But yeah, so that's where I would recommend, but I would be open to talking about it. I've got a lot of topics on my YouTube channel. If you are new, I would recommend exploring my playlist. I've been doing this for a long time and my skill level in composing itself, you can see it grow, uh, through the timeline, but I've got good, I've got several good playlists. If I do say so myself that you can learn a lot from, um, Alex, Hey, I am a self-taught beat producer. Awesome. And I'm currently learning more about chords. Today I came up with a nice progression containing eight chords, that, but I struggle to add a baseline or melody that fits. All right. Awesome. So you want to come up with a baseline that fits start off. Hold up. Turning chords into melody. Check it out. Um, but no, yeah. So when you're taking a chord progression and you want to create a bass line, default, the default method, take the root of each chord and put it down. All right. Put that in the bass line. The bass line does not need to be super interesting. All right. This is a common thing. The most important role of the bass line is to anchor all of the music above it, all right? To provide a unified context on what the harmony is doing. And the easiest and most effective way to do that is to just hit the root note under every chord. Now, of course, that gets boring. So a couple of things you can do from there is just add a rhythmic element to it. So hit each of the root notes and just add rhythm to it. That's fine. It doesn't ruin any, uh, anything. But if you want to do something crazier or more interesting, perhaps, I will recommend harmony for composers. Da, 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 da. Oh, where is it? Bass lines, part eight. Bass lines and chord inversions. Um, but I would say, yeah, you want to create a bass line that's interesting. Start with the roots and just add rhythm to it. If that works, if that's good, perfect. You're awesome. Stop there. The bass line doesn't need to be crazy. That being said, I'm speaking from my perspective as a musician. I'm not a beat maker in any sense of the word. It's a different genre. So I'm not sure if the rules are different for you or the styles are different for you, but that's where you want to start. And then from there you can build on, check out that video. I have gotten several comments on that saying that it's very helpful for electronic music and beat makers and producers. Um, but, uh, melody wise, it's again, I've done this a lot on live streams and lessons before start with the chord progression and pick two notes per chord. So in fact, let's just do one real quick, shall we? This will be a uninspired melody, something super simple. All right, we're just going to do a chord progression, C major, D minor, A minor, 
we'll do F major. We'll just stick with that. All right, that's our chord progression. All I would say is come up with two notes from the, each chord. E, G. Then I'm just gonna say, let's do A, F. Then we'll do uh, E. Then we'll do uh, E, E again. And then we'll do uh, F and A. All right, so this is super simple. I didn't put a lot of thought into it. I improvised it. Literally, all I did was look at each chord and pick two notes. All right, so now I have a very simple, 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 simple melody on top of my chord progression. And then from here, in fact, I'm gonna drop this down to C because I like that better. From here, I can just add some rhythm to it. I can just say, all right, I've got my chords. I got my chordal tones. These are called target tones. Every melody has target tones. Target tones are the longest notes most of the time. They are the most accented notes most of the time. And they are usually from the chords most of the time. All a target tone is, it's an important note for the melody. If you think about reducing the melody, if you were to remove any notes that you didn't think were super important to the melody, the ones that would remain would be the target tones. So the next idea is to just create some kind of rhythm. And again, I'm just using music theory to put this together. So another, re when I talked earlier about uh, having writer's block and just coming up with something intellectual, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not thinking about it too much. I'm just following basic steps that I know should work to create a melody. And then I am putting together, and then I'm just putting together something that I know on an intellectual uh, level will work. So now I've got a nice little melody, or uh, let's speed up the melody a little bit, shall we? All right, so I've got rhythm to my target tones now. The next step is to just add some approach tones. Notes that are mixed in between, they're not part of the chord necessarily, but they help add a bit more movement. Again, this is something where you could sing through and find something that you'd like, but all I'm doing, and I'm just coming up with stuff that's random. Let's hear how this sounds. And then if I were to repeat this whole idea and find a new ending, Again, super simple, overly intellectualized, maybe. No, definitely, that's overly intellectualized. But if I were to do this, say, like five more times, seven more times, eight more times, however many times I want, I know that these steps work. Start with your chord progression, pick two notes per chord, one on beat one, one on beat three, create some general shape. Typically, using sentence structure or period structure helps a lot. And then just Bridge the gap, add some rhythm to it, make it interesting. Again, following period structure or sentence structure. Add some approach tones after the rhythm to give it a bit more personality. If I were to do this multiple times on an intellectual level, come up with 10 melodies. If I really wanted to be crazy, just come up with 10 different melodies. Then tomorrow when I come back, I listen to each of them and go, hold on, hold on. Number four has some promise. All right, bass lines, same thing. Let's just say, all right, C. D, A, and then that was F. C, D, A, F. If I wanted to, I could just do something very simple. Quarter notes, let's see. Super simple, overly intellectualized, but it functions, right? And again, I would never write a melody like this on default. 
I would spend a little more time with it, try to come up with something more inspired or whatever, I appreciate the artistry of it. But if I've got a timeline and I need to come up with something, I'll do this. Half the samples I wrote for my textbook that's coming out and all the examples I use for YouTube pretty much, I write like this. I sit down, I crank something out that works on an intellectual level that demonstrates the concept I'm trying to teach and I move from there. Uh, but yeah, again, check out those two playlists, Melody for Composers, Harmony for Composers. If you want to be able to do this, if you want to be able to just say you can write a melody that you know will work, like this is really helpful. I have literally sat down in a coffee house and written a melody, an entire full length piece as a sample without being able to listen to it in my head. Just having it written down on sheet music, pencil, hand, uh, just hand drawn and no, this works. It works because it functions on an intellectual level. And again, the key to understanding what that functional level is music theory. Check out my playlist, Harmony for Composers, my playlist, Melody for Composers. Or if you got a little patience, December 20th, like I said, Tabletop Academy launching four completely free, in-depth, structured music theory classes for composers who want to learn. All right, let's see here. Fortress, thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, Alex, another question is how to implement multiple chord progressions in one song. I love when my songs develop. Oh, that's just song structure. It doesn't need to be overthought. If you think about song structure, lots of song structures go A, A, B, A. Theme A, that's one chord progression. Theme A again, repeat the chord progression. Theme B, just new chord progression. All right, you can modulate. You can do something different if you want. You can stay in the same key and just do something else. Chord progressions really get a lot more focus than they need to in music. Chord progressions are incredibly important and very useful, but your audience isn't really paying attention to the chord progression. Nine times out of 10, your chord progression is what we call background material. It supports the music, but it's not the thing you want your audience to focus the most on. So I would say if you want to implement a new chord progression, uh, if to use music theory, just follow your song structure. All right, again, my video, I have a video on Melody for Composers playlist that talks about structuring full length pieces, but then you can also just Google things like what are five common song structures? In fact, let's just do that. Five common song structures. All right, there we go. Um, Songwriter 101, Common Song Structures, 2023 Masterclass. Um, yeah, see right here. A, B, A, B, C, B. Chord, verse, chorus, bridge, whatever. They got that one. Intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus. So they got all these different things. A, A, B, A, 32 bar form. Verse, chorus form. A, B, A, B, C, B. What a variation comes from. So yeah, it does, you don't need to overthink it, especially nowadays when pop music has had such a powerful impact on orchestral music, it's fine. Um, just find a structure that you'd like, let it follow through. If you are a film composer, completely different story. Uh, modern structures don't work well for film music because we take the structure from the scene. All right, you don't swap chord progressions because you're bored of the first one. You swap chord progressions because you were working with the hero's theme up to this point. Now you need the sidekick's theme here or the villain's theme or whatever, but you let the scene dictate the structure of your music because that's the ultimate goal uh, is to follow the story. All right, let's see here. Mike, where would you recommend starting from basically zero? I have a DAW, an orchestra, a bug, and a basic grasp of music theory. Awesome. So what are you asking in terms of getting started? You're getting started and like building your skill set because I have two playlists that you can start with. Uh, but no, no, in all seriousness, yeah. If you're working on building your skill, step one, Harmony for Composers playlist. All right, that's why I recommend everybody start. Harmony is my bread and butter. That's what I am best at is chord progressions. If I can get a good chord progression, I know that's going to inform my melody. It's going to inform my accompaniment. It's going to inform everything, including my orchestration. Uh, so I would recommend if you're building chords, uh, your skill set, Harmony for Composer playlist, then Melody co for Composer playlist, then Orchestration playlists. All of which you can also, like I said, wait till December 20th and have a much more structured kind of lessons from my classes. Um, if you are talking about a professional standpoint, networking. Networking is very important. Uh, just start chatting with people, all right? Follow pages on Instagram to uh, Zach Heidi. Zach Heidi is a great resource on YouTube. I'm going to look him up. Zach Heidi. I feel like I've recommended him in the last three uh, streams. Really cool guy. He does a great job on YouTube and his website working with finding work. And then another one I'm gonna say, Cheska Navarro on Instagram. Let me see here, is it loading? Yep, Cheska Navarro, she's really cool as well. 
Check her out. Oh, I got a new follow. Thank you, whoever followed me. Uh, Jessica Yo, follow her on Instagram. She does really good stuff about building a career and finding new people. They're both wonderful people. I've worked with both of them before. Nice people. Check them out. That's where I would recommend getting started if you're trying to figure out how to find work. But of course, building your skill level is super important. So start with those playlists, right? Let's see here. All right, we are coming to the end of the comments, my friends. Uh, Bryce, do you have any advice for making income while trying to get work as a composer? Think about going to a 10-month trade school for instrument repair as a day job. Yeah, go for it. Uh, like I said, my biggest advice is if you're going into music for the income, you're probably going into it for the wrong reason. You need to go into music because you love it. I'm sure you love music. So I, th I like that you're thinking about having a backup plan. So like I said, for me, my first job that I did right out of school when I realized I wanted to be a composer and not a therapist is I grabbed a job and worked as a uh, uh, strength coach for a number of years, uh, for quite a while. I loved it. I really enjoy it. I still love it. I, now I train myself and I train friends who want to learn how to do that stuff. Um, but that's how I made the ends meet. Um, then I, I teach private lessons now. I'm... Um, doing curriculum design for different companies and different schools that want to teach music theory and film composing. I've got a textbook that will be coming out hopefully sometime soon. The publishing process is so so long, people. Uh, but yeah, I sell ebooks and stuff. I do a lot of different stuff. Most composers have to do many different jobs to bring in income. Um, so other than that, I'd say find a job that you like or at worst can tolerate and then can pay your bills. Do that, and then just spend your time on the side doing music. Uh, music is just something that you should do because you would love it. If you want, if you're like me, and you hold up. No, sorry, YouTube keeps popping up saying it wants to run ads. I don't. Is there a way to like disable ads during a stream? I don't mind if people see ads after when they're getting caught up, but I don't like to be cut off in the middle of talking. Um, least of all by people like I don't know Hershey's or. Who, what kind of ads do people get? I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. But yeah, so yeah, you were asking about that. Uh, B. Smith, talking about music school. Like, I recently learned about two and four bar phrasing a la Beethoven, and I want to get better at combining harmonic rhythm with melodic phrase. Um, so if you want to learn more about harmonic rhythm and stuff like that, on reharmonization is really your ticket. So I would recommend a book, Reharmonization by Randy Feltz. It's from the Berkeley Press. Organization, Randy Feltz, uh, great book. Recommend this right here. Reorganization Techniques, paperback, September 1st, 2002, Randy Feltz. Uh, great book. Each chapter talks about different ways to take a basic chord progression and then basically build it up. That it informed a lot of my own personal approach to harmony, where I will start with a basic chord progression, I'll write a melody on top, and then if I feel like it's missing something, I'll go into the weeds and I'll add a, I'll reharmonize. I'll add a lot of cool things. I'll go out of the key, add some chromatic colors. I'll do some uh, subdominant, substitute dominant, or yeah, substitute dominant, secondary dominant, secondary diminished. Do all kinds of cool stuff. Maybe some uh, uh, line cliches or whatever. Just cool little techniques for how to get more color, more personality out of it. Um, so that's what I would recommend. But then again, like I said, I'm also going to recommend for like about the fifth, sixth time today, my playlist. I have so many videos out there, people, and very few of them actually have views. So check them out. I think they're good. Pro I think they're good resources. Um, check them out. And also, if anyone has other YouTube channels that they like, put them in the comments. All right, I'm not one of those people who's trying to keep people just on my channel. Um, yeah, uh, I'll name a couple right now. Ryan Leach, amazing YouTube channel. Check them out if you haven't already. I can't imagine you would be at my channel without knowing who Ryan Leach is. Uh, great channel. Um, Zach Heidi, like I said, amazing. Alex Mukula, very cool channel. He was one of the first ones I ever found, actually. Spitfire Audio has a lot of really cool tutorials. There's lots of great resources out there uh, that you can check out. Uh, Alex, you are a gem, and I will binge your playlists with a notepad. Thank you! Yes, please do. And yes, do take notes, all right? That's the most important thing you can do on YouTube when you're taking notes. Take notes. Review them. I have hundreds and hundreds of flashcards that I go through uh, with an app called Anki, A-N-K-I, and it basically sends me certain flashcards based off how long I, it has since I last saw it, and however, but I've got hundreds if not thousands of flashcards that I'm constantly reviewing to make sure I don't forget any of this stuff. That's how I have gotten several questions before on live streams about how I have all of this stuff in my head. It's because I practice it. I, I practice it, I make sure that I'm studying constantly, I don't think there's a, com a successful composer out there who doesn't study constantly. Uh, even Mozart has a quote. I can't remember the exact quote, but he talks about how he gets praised for being a once-in-a-lifetime prodigy, but he would 
argue back saying that it's because no one else alive has ever put in the amount of hours he has into practicing. Uh, Hans Zimmer talks about constantly practicing and ex uh, exploring new concepts. Um, Tom Hokenberg is the same. Every composer out there who's got a big name for themselves talks about the importance to stay active, to keep studying, to keep learning new things, if for no other reason than to just find new ideas, right? New inspiration. Um, Alex, how do you keep your mental health and work-life balance? Good habits and how do you structure your day? Um, the day depends, every day is a little bit different depending on what I need to get done that day. But for me, um, the two things that I can do, and again, this is more, everyone's a little bit different, but, um, I'd say the two things that are super important for me and staying grounded, especially during kind of like darker patches in my life, um, it's going to be cliche, but relationships. All right. I don't have a lot of friends, but I'm very close to the ones I have. All right, and maybe it's family, maybe it's friends, maybe it's pet. You gotta have something or someone in your life that you have a good, healthy relationship with. Uh, and if you struggle with that, again, I cannot recommend therapy enough. Therapy is not for crazy people, it's for people, all right? Um, then number two is you ha I would recommend you have to have a hobby outside of music. So for me, I love strength training, all right? So, and I like to think that I'm good at strength training. I'm pretty strong. And so I, even on the days where I feel major imposter syndrome and I'm like, all right, my music sucks. I suck. Life sucks. At least I got the gym, right? At least I got something that I'm good at. So yeah, find something, some kind of hobby and try to get better at it. Actively try to get better at it. Not because you're trying to be the best in the world, but because it's really good to be good at something, right? It's very healthy to feel like you're good at something. And music, it's important to feel that way about music, but let's be real, we all have moments where like, oh, did I really write that? That sounds awful. That's just terrible. Am I really a professional musician? I don't know. Stuff like that. So yeah, you're asking big questions about mental health and work-life balance. I'd say in terms of work-life balance, frequent check-ins. All right, that is one thing that I implemented a few years ago that I'm very grateful that I keep up with is once a month or so, I will sit down and I'll think, all right, what's working for me what's not what am i like what do i feel like i'm missing out on what do i feel like i've got too much of and i'll just try again like the training i'll try to put up plans i i flourish off trying to build plans there's just something exciting about realizing i have a goal and i have an idea of how i'm going after it so sometimes you're like all right i'm feeling lethargic so maybe i'll go for more walks or i really feel like the food i've been eating isn't very good so maybe i'll try to get healthier sometimes it's like man you know I haven't really been spending a lot of time with friends or maybe I, even stupid stuff. Like recently I was like, you know what? I don't go to the movies enough. I love going to the movies. That's one of my top, top five favorite things to do is go to the movie theater and see a movie. That's kind of why, why I want to do what I do. I love the movies. My mom says it's because we would never really got to go to the movies a lot as kids. And so now I'm making up for lost time. That could be it. But I just really, really love it. Like last night, oh my gosh, guys, last night I saw the new Studio Ghibli movie with my sister and my brother-in-law and I was so freaking happy. I was singing along to like music on the way there. I was super excited. I could barely sit still. I had a stupid, goofy grin on my face. I got there. I was so happy to see my family, my sister and my brother-in-law. I got there and there was always that moment when the, when the theater, like when the trailers are starting. I'm like, yes, I am just so excited to be sitting here in this seat in front of a giant theater uh, screen and hearing lots of music. So again, that's what I would say. For me, it's about just finding little tiny things like that and constantly looking for improvement. What are things that you would like to do more of? What are things you'd like to spend less time doing? Just make little plans. It doesn't need to be drastic. You can be like, all right, I, I don't go to the movie theater a lot. So maybe if previously I haven't been to the movie theater in months, my new plan is like, all right, sometime this month before December is over, I'm gonna go see a movie. All right, I don't care what the movie is. I just enjoy being there. So I'm going to find some movie. Or maybe you're like, man, I really haven't been getting a lot of sleep. So you think, you know what? At least at least once once this week. Once this week, I'm going to turn off my alarm and just let myself sleep in. Or whatever it is. Do small little things. Small little treat yourself things. Nothing destructive, but like, hey, you know what? The day is getting a little monotonous. Maybe I'm going to drive a different way to the grocery store. Or maybe I'm going to go to a coffee house to do some work or something. Something new, something different as a little treat to yourself. Um, I know I've said a bunch of stuff, but I'd say that's another big one. Once a week, treat yourself to something and it doesn't have to be big. This idea that you need to buy yourself something to treat yourself. 
No, you can go to a park you haven't been to in a long time. You can spend a little extra time watching a TV show that you've fallen behind on. You could read a book that you haven't read since you were a kid. Just do something, something out of the ordinary to treat yourself. It doesn't have to be expensive. Sometimes, like I said, it's just as simple as going a different way home to just have something new, something feel like it's out of the ordinary and growing. But that's that's me. That's what I would have to say. Um, Bryce, Matt Kenyon is a really good channel for video game music. Ooh, awesome. I'll check him out. Yes, Guy Mitchell Moore, Bryce says. Yes, Guy Mitchell Moore. I do know him. He's a great channel. Uh, 8-Bit Music Theory is a nice channel. Talk about treating yourself. I love doing little videos on 8-Bit Music uh, Theory. Not because I feel like... Uh, I mean, yeah, I've learned a lot of stuff from him. But a lot of the time, also, we lose track of why we love music. And so 8-Bit Music Theory is one of those channels where I always go back to just to geek out. It's like, all right, he's got a video on a video game I really like. And the music. I don't care that to take notes or anything. I'm not trying to get better. I just want to geek out over something. So I'm going to watch his video and see, oh, that's awesome. That's cool. I love that. Um, Jack is seconding Guy Mitchell Moore. Uh, get your creativity biscuits beforehand. Uh, uh, Bryce Fullman and the sunglasses of doubt. Sunglasses of doubt. What is that? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, even seems like a healthy mindset to look and treat our works more as exercises and even big projects. Um, uh, instead of, as I regularly fall into, evaluating our own efficiency for a single artwork like strict test with grades and the chance of failing with exercise, we don't fail for, but we explore. Go exactly, yes. Music should just be little exercises. All right, that's all it is. You are writing music because you love to write music. All right, that's why we're all here. I'm assuming that's why all of you are here. I might have a couple family members here who just have me running in the background to beef the numbers. I don't know. Um, but no, I assume everybody here is here because you love to write music. All right, and don't lose sight of that. When you're writing music, we're just writing it because we love to write music, and it has the really cool side effect of just making you better. All right, so yeah, don't overcorrect yourself. Uh, uh, comparison is the thief of joy, as they say. Um, but wow, I feel like we covered some big stuff today, guys. You guys asked some deeper questions than I was expecting. But that is officially like, what, an hour, almost an hour and a half. I don't see any more questions coming up. So I think I'm going to stay around for a couple more minutes in case anybody has some last minute questions. But if not, I think we're getting ready to call it a day, guys. Taking a sip of my lightly caffeinated water because I have a crippling caffeine addiction. All right, I'm not seeing anything else. So we'll call it a day, shall we? All right, thank you everyone who stopped by i hope you learned something new today i hope it was helpful i hope it was entertaining at the very least um if you have any requests for future videos or future lessons or topics make sure you follow me on youtube and instagram i make posts once a week announcing the live streams on fridays and you can make suggestions and requests there uh check out my uh website i've got ebooks i've got free blog posts i've got a new series of free classes coming up and yeah, you can reach me there. You can even, if you're looking for private lessons, I teach private lessons as well. So in the meantime, all right, I'll see everybody later. All right, see you in the next video. Have a good one, people. Enjoy your weekend. Do something nice for yourself. That's the last thing. All right, bye-bye.